I wanted to show you um, a couple of examples of, uh, of this. Uh, basically, queer linguistics is part of the so-called uh, critical discourse analysis uh, umbrella. And uh, um, there's been uh, writing about that, so I would say, uh, starting with uh, um, Eiko Moschenbacher, I don't know if I pronounced his name well. And it's, uh, he's also now uh, uh, an editor of a journal, Language and Sexuality, uh, which is really based on queer linguistic, what, what queer linguistic as a discipline should, uh, should look like. So basically, uh, uh, queer linguistic comes from critical discourse studies, uh, which make transfers the way in which language and discourse either construct, the reinforce, or challenge and subvert normativity. So normativity and heteronormativity is, is a very key word in this, uh, um, uh, in this field. So um, basically there is uh, um, uh, an interest in analyzing instances of discourse that subverts hegemonic notion of gender and sexuality uh, to reinforce in question or subverting the status quo. Uh, so um, queer linguistics uh, has put a lot of emphasis on the idea of <laughs> sexuality. And this is a slide that I really uh, borrowed from um, uh, Veronica Curler. I went uh, um, a couple of weeks ago to a meeting at the uh, BAAL, the Association of uh, Linguistic Association. Uh, I don't remember all the, the study of the name. Uh, so it's basically um, a, a subgroup of a linguistic association which looks at um, topics of gender and sexuality. And Veronica, for example, Veronica um, um, teaches uh, topics in Lancaster, and she looked at the genealogy of studies on gender and sexuality starting from the 60s. So she produced this uh, uh, slide by saying that there was a period in the 60s, 70s, in which we were interested in looking at gay slang, for example, and the slang glossaries of homosexual slang. Then the, we moved on to uh, talking about gay and lesbian language. So we, we're talking about the 80s and the 90s here till the uh, Lip and Wall stuff 2004. Uh, then uh, we are uh, now moving into uh, <coughs> talking about sexuality. So sexuality uh, came into the plot of really kind of recently. And for example, there, was, there were four uh, um, the um, uh, Lavender Language and Linguistic Conference uh, talked mainly about gender. Uh, but uh, recently, uh, the, the Journal on Language and Sexuality that came up in 2012, which has the more sexuality uh, alongside gender. So uh, you can see that uh, the, the idea of sexuality has come to the, the fore. And so probably, um, I would say, this is the main kind of uh, uh, underpinning of, of queer linguistics. Um, so, in terms of queer linguistics, uh, what did I do? I mean, uh, recently, uh, when I... Um, we co-edited this, this book uh, that I mentioned before. This is the Dracken book. Sorry. Uh, basically, with this, uh, with this book, we were uh, interested in, uh, we came across a stumbling problem. Uh, how do we refer to the participants of the book? The participants were um, um, activists to the Dracken's uh, performances. And uh, some of them didn't refer to themselves as mm -hmm. either neither female or male. So we had to find uh, um, a way in which we could represent them uh, faithfully. So uh, uh, of course, the drag king. When we talked about drag king, we used the uh, masculine gender. Uh, but uh, in case, in some cases, uh, um, this participant didn't want to us to use neither masculine. So we, um, we decided to use the, uh, uh, the asterisk, which is a device used uh, in uh, LGBT communities, LGBTQI communities, which has started, it was, was used, uh, has been used in the last, uh, say, eight, uh, eight, seven, eight years. There's, uh, there's, uh, we're not sure about it, how many years ago. Uh, another device that we used was the art, the chiocciola. And, uh, but then we came up with another uh, um, device, which was the uh, use of uh, the ending U, like the neuter. The ending U is being used in some blogs uh, by uh, Kanye Scholte, who's a group, uh, which is a group in Rome, uh, which for 
around uh, three, three years ago. Uh, they occupy the space in Rome and they do research on transfeminist. And they use the U, uh, um, the ending U, and instead of O, um, o A, uh, to represent this uh, transgender uh, kind of uh, transgender, or not to represent either the male or the female, to just uh, challenge the binaries, and the gender binaries. Uh, of course, uh, we don't know if uh, this, uh, how this is being received. Uh, we know that there is a controversy around that, but then we'll see what uh, the other panelists will, will have to say about that. So what queer linguistic basic does is partially also this. Uh, looks at a language which is more inclusive, I would say. Oh, but uh, nec not necessarily just that. Uh, what queer linguistic does is mainly look at the uh, question of heteronormativity, heteronormativity hegemo hegemony, and homophobia, but also at desire and sexual practices. And recently also at the, uh, the idea of trans identities. So uh, these are kind of the topics that queer linguistic deal with, and I think also some of us are dealing with today. So, um, certainly if you look at that, uh, it's very interesting to see also in the papers we uh, received for our uh, issue, the idea what what, uh, what is the, um, the value of a queer linguistic in analyzing phenomena, like for example the one of the civil union of the DECO. We can look at the presence of words like, uh, for example, uh, stepchild adoption, the, um, the fact that these words are borrowed from, uh, from English, they're not translated, in a sense to cause a bit of uh, confusion, or look at the presence of words like homosexuals as opposed to heterosexuals. Heterosexual words never present, or there's one instance in a corpus that uh, the person analyzed, as opposed to the many times in which, in which the word homosexual is, is that present. Or for its fact, the fact that the still uh, the word lesbian is basically um, very rare in the corpus analyzed. And when we talk about civil unions, we talk about, about gay male um, and uh, people and not lesbians. So uh, these are kind of the issues that we deal with and also I deal with. So I wanted to show you uh, an example to conclude with which is based on a rape, a rape <coughs> case uh, in Italy, uh, which happened in 2008, and uh, uh, it's called the Stupro della Fortezza. Uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar with, there was a, there was a debate last year you know, um, in, um, in relation to this. So basically a 23 uh, years old woman was uh, uh, raped in uh, uh, Florence by uh, six guys, six men. And uh, um, these uh, um, guys were um, uh, basically um, uh, sentenced, uh, but uh, last year they appealed against the sentence and uh, they were clear of the rape last year. So um, this still a uh, big debate, a big uh, you know, criticism and also in the social network. And there was the uh, blog of Patrick Murray that reported also uh, on this and also publish, uh, published the letter of the victim who uh, kind of responded to uh, the criticism and the, um, the debate surrounding uh, this sentence. So I wanted to talk about and, and show a couple of a few examples of discourses used surrounding this, uh, this, uh, this case. And uh, so basically, um, the case, the sentence is based on the moral condemnation of the, um, uh, the woman, of the victim, based on her lifestyle. And uh, which you know, we know is nothing new, but uh, also on the fact that there was no sufficient opposition uh, to her assailant, but we know there were six uh, men against one, one person. And, uh, and on the fact that these uh, guys didn't interpret well the intentions of, um, of the victim. So I wanted to look at uh, the motivation and the morality surrounding about that and looking at them through the lenses of queer linguistics, what, what this uh, um, discourse can tell us about heteronormativity or, or sexuality. Um, so um, I wanted to read some of the motivations of the sentence just to, to give you a bit of background. 
So, uh, in terms of morality, there is a, um, uh, the motivation are based on the morality of the fact per se. So, we're going back to, you know, the la legge sulla moralità, so the, the rape as, uh, as something against morality, and the morality of the victim. Okay, so there are two kind of levels here. So, la vicenda è ingresciosa, non incomiabile per nessuno, ma penalmente non censurabile. Uh, so there are a lot of oppositions in this, and I think it's, it's interesting to see how also uh, the idea of gender sexuality play with uh, kind of oppositions. So uh, basically, say the fact is disagreeable, but it's not punishable in criminal terms. Um, uh, the woman is described as a soggetto fragile, ma al tempo stesso creativo, disinibito. Um, and they say, oh, she even participated in a film plus splatter because one of the rapists was an um, uh, independent filmmaker and she was an actress in, in his films. And so uh, she had already did, um, she had uh, participated in uh, scenes of sexual violence. So, in grado di gestire la propria bisessualità, and now the term bisessualità enters the, the, the scene. Di avere rapporti fisici occasionali di cui nel contempo non è convinta. So she was able to do that, but at the same time she was not convinced about what she was doing. So um, the sentence was justified on the fact that the woman was allegedly having a non-linear life, una vita non lineare, uh, because she had a bisexual, non-conforming life, so, so they kind of go and um, um, report on her previous relationship, the fact that she ha avuto due rapporti occasionali, un rapporto di convivenza e un omosessuale. So she was living a non-linear life for the fact that she had an homosexual relationship, she was uh, living with a, with a um, boyfriend, and she had two occasional uh, relationships. So we, we're really touching on a lot of, you know, kind of um, things at the moment. So, and seminar entitled Sex in Transition, she's done some, some kind of workshop, and she campaigns for LGBT rights. So all that can, can, comes into the plot in, in, in constructing the narrative that surrounding her. So I wanted to just uh, you know, quickly analyze these discourses and conclude by saying that these discourses can help unmasking the sexism, of course, we're talking about sexism and misogyny, underpinning this sentence, but also the power of heteronormativity reinforced in people's life through the phrase vita non lineare. What is vita non lineare? She was not straight. But she was not straight, and this not being straight meant not being capable of deciding and kind of being confused about what happened to her. So this can, uh, kind of uh, um, judgment about her life and about her non heteronormativity comes to underpin her credibility as a witness. So um, there is confusion, for example, uh, ambivalence around the standards. La giovane aveva un accesamento ambivalente nei confronti del sesso. So since she was ambivalent towards sex, she was uh, ambivalent towards reco uh, recollecting what happened to her that night. So we can't really trust her. Okay, so the credibility comes with, uh, basically, um, is, is attached to uh, ideas of gender and sexuality, in particular sexuality. And uh, so I, what, I was thinking that this case really uh, lays itself very well to an analysis that brings together you know, sexism and, and also uh, heteronormativity. And this is what queer linguistic is doing, is trying to underpin different discourses around that. And also the fact that she was bisexual, of course, also is reflected in the use of oppositions, the conjunction but, yes, but, and the use of different, you know, um, uh, terms and nouns and, and adjectives to describe her. For example, there was also a case, la vittima era non sobria, so she, they don't say she's drunk, ma presente a se stessa. So it's, it's, it's a continuous, it's, a, it's a sort of that. So I wanted to just conclude by saying that uh, um, this shows what, uh, you know, hetero, this shows uh, what uh, this course, uh, um, uh, uh, these discourses uh, produce uh, and, and what uh, kind of um, elements they touch upon, but also they can give us a, a, an idea about how to counteract them because this sentence tear up a lot of criticism 
through social network and there were um, a demonstration organized at the end of July last year in support of, 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 this, uh, of the victim of this, uh, of this sentence. I don't want to call her the victim, but I don't know her name, so the, the person involved. <laughs> But yes, because she doesn't want to, uh, she, she replied to that, she said, I'm not a victim, I don't want to be victimized in the, of the discourse about victimization of our, of ourself. And also there was, a, um, uh, there was an hashtag uh, that was created, it was Nessuna Scusa, and this is uh, um, the, the slogan that was uh, produced by uh, groups in Rome, activist uh, transfeminist group, and they organized La Caminata Romana, which was a walk, a demonstration in support of uh, this, uh, and against this sentence. So, posso essere muda o vestita, homo, heterosessuale, sobbia o briaca, nessuna scusa, la violenza, violenza. Okay, so I conclude with this, and maybe we can uh, start the conversation.